One of the things that I think of when I think of courageous leadership is occasionally saying things that people aren't going to want to hear, but that need to be said anyway. Um, and I'm going to do my best to model that with you here today <laughs> by saying at least one thing that everybody will not like. Uh, just a little bit of a warning. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the, the great organization that I work for. Um, NCG is a cooperative. Uh, we are your cooperative. We are owned by 148 retail food co-ops across the country. Um, we are governed by a board of directors that's comprised of general managers from those food co-ops across the country. We collectively operate about 190 stores in about 38 states and serve roughly 1.3 million consumer owners. Um, and uh, within this organization, we've got a, a lot of different kinds of stores serving different kinds of markets. Um, we've got co-ops in Fairbanks, Alaska, all the way to Brooklyn, New York. We've got co-ops in Austin, Texas, all the way to Grand Marais, Minnesota, in all kinds of markets uh, serving uh, various demographics of people. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity of store types and co-op types within NCG. The, the, the one common denominator, besides being co-ops, I suppose, is that uh, everybody is trying to figure out how to effectively respond to and thrive in the competitive landscape that is changing very radically. So we went around to every audience that we could find last year. Um, we went to workshops, we went to co-op cafes, we went to conferences. We're trying to talk about the uh, overall market changes that are leading to a, a vastly changing, a changing competitive landscape. And really, what, what's happening in a nutshell, because we spent a lot of time talking, I'd encourage you to look at the video if you haven't seen it. It's on the uh, CDS uh, video library. Um, but the overall thing that's changed is that our, our growth, co-op's historic growth, and for many years we had fantastic historic growth, but that growth was based on people making lifestyle changes. It was based on people who were shopping at Festival, or Kroger, or Hy-Vee, or Publix, going through some kind of change in their life, whether it be you know, first child, uh, health scare, wanting to be vital as they uh, uh, move along in years. Um, whatever it was, people had a change in their lives that caused them to leave their current location and find the purveyor of foods that is healthier and will lead to a healthier lifestyle. And for many years, that was us. Uh, in fact, we didn't even have to make it easy for people. Uh, people had to come to us because we had the product that they wanted. But the new normal is increasingly that not only do consumers have more choices than ever when selecting a place to go for that product, but they don't even have to leave their festival or their Safeway or their Kroger anymore because those retailers are getting so much better at providing the kind of products that the consumers want. So our growth is gone and we see it playing out. Um, these are some headlines, by the way, just talking about how uh, growth is, the new normal is continuing to impact our community. Um, Whole Foods is about to launch a smaller format store, um, you know, 15,000 square feet, mostly fresh foods and the center store being mostly their private label brand that they can uh, sell very uh, affordably. Uh, Kroger's doing a similar format. They've got something they're going to be doing this year called Main and Vine, which is a smaller format, fresh focused store for urban markets. Uh, Kroger's having a huge year, actually. They just purchased Roundies, giving them access to our market up here in the upper Midwest. Um, they also are seeking to acquire the Fresh Market, which is a small regional chain in the Southeast, uh, and we'll probably seal the deal on that pretty soon. In the meantime, our conventional friends, uh, Walmart, uh, just investing in, in hundreds of new staff to go out and improve the, the fresh performance at their stores. Uh, Target is experimenting with new grocery formatting at one of their stores in the Twin Cities right now. They know that they're not meeting consumer needs either. They need to change. Um, and, uh, and on and on, whether it's technology, new online services, or our existing competitors opening more stores, the new normal continues to impact us. Most significantly in sales, this is just an extension of the graph that we were showing last year, showing the trending decline in sales growth for NCG co-ops as a whole. And right now, as a system, we are down as of fourth quarter uh, last year, fourth quarter 15, we're down to just over 2% sales growth uh, as a whole. Um, and many of our co-ops are experiencing negative sales growth. Um, but what's really kind of scarier it, it, for me is that um, half of NCG co-ops are now experiencing negative sales growth in their produce departments. More than half of NCG co-ops are experiencing negative growth in their bulk departments. And what's, what's troubling about that is those are two departments in which co-ops have traditionally planted their flag as we're untouchable here. This is where we stand out. This is where we're special. 
This is where the formula works the best. And it turns out that that's not playing out in many markets. Um, this is continuing. Um, in terms of margin, well, we just, the more competition there is, the more downward pressure there is on prices. And co-ops need to be somewhat competitive in price to be able to continue to attract customers. So the trend is for continuing downward pressure on margins. And at the same time, there's increasing uh, upward pressure on personnel expenses. Now, we all know that the cost of benefits just goes up all the time, right? That never stops. But what's interesting now is that there's a real substantive push, upward push, on wages as well, all across the country. But it's happening in co-op markets. And uh, it's pushing that personnel expense goes up. So as our margins go down and our personnel expense goes up, what happens with the fun uh, remainder that we have left to play with? Um, it shrinks, of course. Uh, EBITDAP is an industry term, earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, um, and patronage in this case. It's really the money that's left over with which we can do cool things, right? So whether it's invest in your community, whether it's more purchases to local farmers, whether it's bonuses, whether it's um, in reinvesting in your business. And actually there, it's, we're seeing a critical problem because as co-ops have less money with which to reinvest in their business, they're holding off, they're hunkering down. And that makes them more vulnerable to the next competitor who comes into the market with their shiny new store. As they fail to reinvest, they lose customers to the new, the new competitors that are investing. And it becomes a negative feedback loop. So uh, this is really having a significant impact on co-ops' ability to be competitive. And of course, we see more co-ops with negative growth um, every quarter. Uh, it seems as though uh, about 30% of co-ops in NCG have negative sales growth right now. About a third, another third, are living in what we call a low or no growth state, which is you know, 0 to 3 or 4%. Both are hard. Obviously, negative sales growth is worth, worse, but both are hard. And both are very far removed from the double-digit growth that we had known for years. Um, and it's, it's impacting more and more co-ops. More co-ops are going into crisis. Um, in addition, there's just increasing complexity in being a business owner now anyway, whether it's the Food Safety Modernization Act, PCI Compliance, Fair Labor Standard Act changes, Affordable Care Act. Um, the increasing complexity in the business is requiring a higher level of talent and skill set than we maybe have. Um, there's a talent gap even for entry level positions because our competitors are competing for great, smiling, friendly staff as well. So, so everywhere there's a level of, of um, competition, uh, even for, for staff and talent. Um, and as there's a need for changes in the system, there is an automatic response for those of us who have been around the longest to maybe entrench ourselves to hold back on making any changes. Um, and we see this playing out in a lot of markets. Um, and of course, you know, just a quick note about this, this particular co-op, I guarantee you there's nobody on the board of this co-op or anybody in management and co-op who wants to think of as being a poor employer. All of them want to be seen and be the co-op that is able to be a great employer to their staff. And this is really painful for the co-op because chances are the co-op doesn't know how to offer better wages. They are stuck. They're in a competitive rut where they've got low sales growth and shrinking EBITDA. They don't know how to offer higher wages to the staff that are there. And it's also painful because the person who put this flyer up is probably right, that, that you cannot live on $9 an hour, right? And we know, we know through research and data that most co-ops haven't increased their livable wage model or adjusted their livable wage model to account for increasing, drastically increasing costs of rent specifically. So, you know, and, and on top of that, my guess is the person who put this flyer up also doesn't really understand that maybe that $15 an hour doesn't apply to every single market. And it really doesn't. There are some markets that can sustain that. Right now, for a business to be successful, there are some markets that can't. So all of this is putting, a, all this pressure is, is focused on the board of directors here and the staff and the management, and it's an ugly place to be. Um, so uh, some more headlines. These are all examples of co-ops that are either trying to make changes to adjust to the new normal, or co-ops that are not making the necessary changes and getting called out for it. Um, and, uh, and just a quick note about unions. We have many co-ops that have great relationships with their union. This is not a comment about unions. But the process of unionizing is often distracting and uh, can take focus off of a co-op at the time when it really needs to be focusing on the consumer right now. In order to keep our sales growth going and to be competitive, we need to focus on our consumer. And so the process of unionization is usually always a little bit um, challenging, but 
in today's market, it can be especially damaging as it's trying to adjust to the realities of the new normal too. But my guess is, is that that's an example of a co-op that was being asked to make changes from their staff for many years and didn't make the changes and is forced to deal with the repercussions of that. All of this is leading, all this additional pressure, the new complexity, is causing one of the greatest turnovers in general management that we've ever seen, or even more so than we expected. We knew there was going to be a lot of retirements for general managers who've been with our co-ops for years. Those general managers are looking at the competitive market and the pressure on the job and uh, the complexity of it, and they're saying, I, I don't even want to finish this out necessarily. This is more challenging than I was ever really thinking it would be. And then we've got these bright young people willing to step into those roles, and they step in, and, and they, after three months, they say, hell with this. This is the hardest job I could have ever possibly imagined. The job of the general manager, and I will say this now, it's one of the most difficult jobs I can possibly think of. You have so many stakeholders that you have to help um, uh, uh, consider in your decision making. You've got so much uh, talent uh, that, or, or skills that you need to be able to have to be effective in that role. It's an incredibly challenging job, and as more of our GMs are turn, uh, turning over, our co-ops are also realizing they're not able to attract anybody into these positions. And part of that is because we're actually not paying our general managers right either. Many of our co-ops aren't paying market value for the skill set required, and we're not able to attract the talent that we need. So maybe we settle for somebody who is not able to do what's necessary, and it causes Again, a feedback loop. So these are real challenges facing us. Um, and it leads us to this topic of change. So well, here's some examples of courageous leadership. My example, uh, my definition of courageous leadership is, is just that it's not something you know when you see it. It's something you know when you feel it. Because it's uncomfortable. And it's painful. And it's not something you want to do. It's something that you have to overcome in order to do. Um, and so. Uh, so while these are all good examples, the one common denominator I can think of for courageous leadership is that you don't want to do it. It's, it's hard. Most of us actually pick and choose when we exhibit courageous leadership because very few people have the, the fortitude to be able to exhibit courageous leadership in every aspect of their lives. But the message that I want to convey today is that there's so many necessary changes for co-ops to continue to be a viable business that we have to be, we can't pick and choose where we're going to move our business. Um, we have to be able to do all of it uh, in many cases, and that's very difficult. Why is courageous leadership today? Well, ultimately, we need to change. Co-ops need to change in some fundamental ways. Not every co-op needs to change in every way. Markets are going to vary somewhat, but we think that most co-ops need to be more competitive in pricing, that they need to be offering more accessible product offerings, and that they need improved productivity. And each one of those is a Herculean feat. And I'll walk through each one a little bit quickly. I know I'm going to lose most of you on the second one. But let's start with the first one. This is, this is a high V market. They're a regional competitor. They're very strong in their customer service. And they impact a lot of co-ops. Um, and this is an example of high V market putting out a mailer to flyers that takes a receipt from the local co-op and compares it on the same items to a receipt from high V and shows how much people will save by shopping at high V. And this went out on social media and came to us. And the big thing that I would hear co-op consumers say is, look at this awful attack ad from hy V. This is so unfair. This is like a political attack ad. This is terrible. And my response is, no, this is business in the new normal. That the conventional retailers have done this to each other for years. They bludgeon each other over the head for a half percent sales growth. So, so it's painful for co-ops to acknowledge that this is happening. But the reality is, this is what it takes to be a business in today's market. That this is common, and we have to be prepared for it. And we know that this is a challenge for co-ops still, that prices are the third most important factor that shoppers, co-op shoppers, consider when looking for a place for grocery, uh, just below uh, freshness and quality and the availability of organics and natural foods. Um, but only 30% of co-op shoppers are satisfied with how their co-ops are working on price. And this continues. Um, and it's actually related to the product piece. So this is when you pull out the pitchforks and torches. But what we have here in this picture, and I know you might not be able to see it, we have a case of uh, one pound strawberries. Uh, you can't see the detail, but the strawberries are going bad on the shelf. And they're being sold for $10.99. This is a co-op that has been seeing negative sales growth for about six quarters, and is considering shutting its doors. And they've asked us to come in as a last-ditch effort to say, what are we doing wrong? 
We've, we're, we've, we're, we've got the, what, what was working for us for years is just, I don't know, it's not working anymore. What's going wrong? And, and the first thing we said is you can't do this. You can't sell organic strawberries for $10.99 and expect that your customers are going to choose that. They, we can't do anything. That's what the price of stra organic strawberries is now. And we said, well, then you have to offer conventional strawberries. And that, of course, is when you know, the ground fell out and everybody just died. Um, <laughs> but, but here's the reality, is that, that the, the, the produce manager here is committed to the organic piece. They've got conventional in every other department in their store, but it's committed to the organic piece. The shoppers like the idea that the co-op is pure in its product selection. So he's afraid of shopper response. The general manager is afraid of shopper response. The board of directors is afraid of shopper response. Even though it's probably a fairly small vocal minority of shoppers who are going to respond, nobody wants to deal with that. The silent majority, and we call them mid-level shoppers, it's about 65% of your, your sales go to the silent majority or the mid-level shopper. The silent majority does not complain about the price here. They just go to the other store and get them cheaper whether they're conventional or not. And the, the, the produce manager here said, well, we should be teaching our customers that you can't buy strawberries out of season. And I sympathize, but the consumers are driving our business. The consumers want strawberries out of season. They're not going to change their buying habits because the co-op says you should. They just go to the other retailer. And while they're there, they're also going to pick up their milk and their pasta and their apples and everything else because it's usually cheaper and easier. That's a hard lesson. This co-op did not like this lesson. But this co-op, if it does not figure out a way to offer both, and we're not saying either or necessarily. We want our, our mid-level shopper wants the ability to choose for themselves whether they purchase value or values. And it will change on every single shopping trip. Sometimes they will choose organic. Sometimes they will choose conventional. Sometimes the most important thing is how healthy the product is. Sometimes it's the price of it. And if we do not offer that choice to our competitors, they will find, or to our shoppers, they will find a competitor who is willing to offer that choice. I would suggest that it's important for us to continue doing the amazing product sourcing work we've always done and offer, when we cannot offer a product at an affordable price, an alternative that will allow them to choose. Let's talk about productivity very quickly. Um, productivity is just the answer to the dilemma between the increasing pressure on personnel expense and the decreasing pressure on wages. And what it really comes down to is having fewer, better paid workers. Better paid, how can that possibly be? How can we improve our personnel expense if we're paying people more? Well, the reality is that that's part of the equation. And it needs to be an agreement with our staff that we can be the employer that all of us wants us to be and offer a fair wage. But in order to do that, we are going to need to have fewer workers working the hours that we really need them for us to be a successful business. Um, and, and, you know, contrary to what people think, the, one of the questions I would always ask when I was hiring at a co-op, why do you want to work at our co-op? The most common response that I would get is because everybody seems so laid back. It's, it seems so easy going here. It seems like a place where I could just talk to everybody and it would be great. That's a dangerous thing to bring into our co-op as personnel at a time when we really need to be productive and efficient. And I know that everybody likes the familial relationships that we build at co-ops, but we need people working hard during the hours we need them. And if they do that, we can pay them more. But you have to have both, and it's a difficult conversation to have with staff. All these things require leadership. Price requires courageous leadership because it's hard to do. Because you have to dedicate yourself to a very difficult task that requires a lot more attention than it ever did. Our buyers, they, they like product. They want to bring in cool product, new product that they've never seen before, and brands and merchandise. And doing pricing work is the unsexiest work you can possibly imagine. But that's what's necessary today. Um, product we're going to meet is requires courageous leadership because our vocal uh, core, the people who have been fueling our business, aren't going to like it, and they're going to tell us. They're going to let us know. And and um, productivity is going to require some uh, courageous leadership because it requires difficult, honest conversations with our key, most important stakeholder, which is our employees. And it's, it's going to be a challenging conversation. It makes us uncomfortable. But the reality is conflict is part of the world. And conflict can be good. All boats rock. Um, that's part of what it takes to be in this world. Uh, we're not here to stand still. We're here to grow and evolve and move. And our co-ops are that way, too. 
you're going to see so much resistance to any of these changes if you decide to push forward with them. You're going to help people tell you we should go back to the good old days. There's actually a movement in the East right now that we should go back to the days of, of you know, smaller format stores with garbage cans selling bulk bins and no registers and that kind of thing. There's, there's a, a, a nostalgia for the way things were. And there's people who say that we're not capitalist organizations. We shouldn't have to compete. That's a capitalist virtue, competition. We should, be, we should be above that. You're going to have people say, you're not a real co-op anymore. Whether it's you selling conventional stuff on your sales floor, whether it's telling your workers that you'll pay them more, but you need them to work more in return, all of that is going to be considered to be not a real co-op anymore. Um, and then the final one is just not being democratic. That by pushing through a hard change and not having a general vote for it, it's not democratic. We've seen, we saw the slides before about board members resigning, GMs being uh, driven out. Uh, these changes are hard, they're difficult, and they're painful. But here's the, the thing for me is, is that um, we're looking at a time when we're celebrating our co-op's 35th and 40th and 45th anniversaries. And I think how cool that is, that we've been these amazing, fantastic community-focused businesses for that long, and how successful we've been in that time. What we have now is a market that's changed, and it's never going to change back. This is not a short-term storm. This is the new normal for all of us. And we have to figure out how we're going to adjust to that new normal. And the answer might be slightly different for each co-op, because we do work in different markets. But we think that most of you are going to have to work on at least one of those three areas that I suggested today. And you might have other areas. Maybe you need to update your bylaws. Maybe you need to reinvest in your business and do a remodel at a time when you don't have a lot of capital. Maybe there's all these things that you could possibly do that would require courageous leadership. I would request that today have some great conversations with each other. Talk about what kind of courageous leadership is necessary at your co-op. Talk about how you will, what's the game plan for pushing forward and making the necessary changes. Because ultimately, we want to see the enough changes made so that our co-ops will be around to celebrate their 50th and 60th and 70th anniversaries in the years to come. So thank you so much. Appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk to you and have some great conversations with each other today.